Okay. It is a very particular challenge going from one genre to another at the risk of stating the obvious. In a book, you can take time to explore nooks and crannies of the story through narrative and description and exploration of a character's inner thoughts. And a play, of course, is made up entirely of dialogue. So that's job number one, is to sort through the dialogue that already exists in the novel and see what does it add up to if you take it uh, on its own without any addition. Now, of course, there are going to be gaps because novel goes back and forth between dialogue and narrative, dialogue and narrative. So the primary challenge at that point becomes identifying what kind of connective tissue we need to create to tell the full story with dialogue and all the other things that go into a play. A play script, of course, is just a blueprint, a starting place for an ensemble of actors and creative people. We can tell a lot of the story through visuals or through subtextual relationships, things that get conveyed with a glance across a table or somebody turning their head away. That's storytelling in its own right. So the biggest challenge was sorting through what, what was I going to lift wholesale from Alice's wonderful novel, and what was I going to have to figure out how to create in the rehearsal room with the actors? Um, I don't want to... Let me just say, you want to open the floor right now for questions, or you want me to... Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay. Yeah, whenever you're... Uh... Uh, did everybody hear the question, or should I repeat the question? Okay, the question is, uh, do we take pieces of narration or narrative from the novel and turn it into dialogue on stage? Uh, yes. The answer is yes. And if you're familiar with the novel, if you've read it recently, you will have that experience when you come to see our production of the play. Things that were descriptive all of a sudden are coming out of a character's mouth. So that you have to take a certain amount of artistic license, figuring out who is the best character to be speaking these words, which were not written to be spoken at all originally, but are a vital part of the story itself, and we have to get that information out there. One thing that Alice and I agreed on from the outset was that we would not have a narrator in the play. As most of you know, the novel has a narrator, uh, but we share an aversion to narration-heavy uh, theater. Of course, there's a long tradition of that in the theater. Think of a play like The Glass Menagerie. It's structured as a series of uh, narrative monologues to the audience uh, from Tom Winfield, and then he steps back into his own story and acts certain things out. We didn't want to do that. Uh, fortunately, the, the setup, the premise of the novel, is one in which people are telling stories to each other. People are sharing remembrances of Billy. And so I was confident that we could get the fundamental expository information out there without having a narrator. That said, we do have this character who is the narrator in the novel, Dennis's daughter, called Rosemary in the play. And we see her watching the flashbacks of Billy's life. All the other characters, uh, if you've seen the play, you understand there are flashbacks. And then there's the present tense of the play, which is at the funeral dinner. And these worlds are separate, except for a few characters who go back and forth. Rosemary watches the flashbacks, and that was a, a little theatrical device that I decided to insert as a director, as a homage, if you will, to people who know and, and love the novel. So we see her seeing the story. She becomes the audience's proxy, if you will. Or, as a friend of mine said, I looked up and I saw her watching the flashback and I realized, oh, there's somebody who knows as little as I do. I'll just pay attention to whatever she's paying attention to and then I'll get the story. And, and that seems to have worked out well. People are responding. <coughs> up here. I love the book and I love the play, but one thing I missed was the, the narrator's story. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing that So the, the, the question and comment is about what gets left out. Uh, and indeed, 
it, it can just it can just tear you apart when you have to leave some of these things out. But if you tried to dramatize the whole thing, you know, we'd have an eight-hour mini-series uh, on PBS, which would, that might be fun. Maybe we should do that next time. <laughs> uh, you're referring to Dennis's daughter, who ends up marrying the son of the gentleman who's renting the summer house in Long Island. Uh, of course, these are the tough decisions that, as an adapter, you have to make. My goal was to streamline the story so that we could do it in a single evening of theater. And then the artistic license, which I was given by Alice very generously, was to hone in on the characters and the themes which were most meaningful to me. If someone else were to do a stage adaptation of this, I'm sure it would be entirely different. And they might gravitate toward that particular uh, storyline in the thing. Uh, you know, I've, I've never asked you really about that, about what, you know, what you've missed along the way. What, what is, what's your response to, to this woman's question? Well, I, uh, I have been sort of contemplating the idea of this wonderful cross-genre, that is, read the novel and then see the play. Um, someone said to me after one of the performances that uh, she had missed the fact that Dennis and May get married um, and felt that wasn't in the play. And I said to her, but he still does. When you leave the play, you know if you've read the book, oh, isn't that great? You know, Dennis and May were going to get married. And, and when Dennis in the play says we're going to rent, we might rent the house, if you've read the book, you know they are going to rent the house, and that's where Rosemary is going to meet her future husband. So you can, I, I think about uh, one of my favorite plays uh, is Stoppard's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern of Dead. And, and I've been thinking, watching. Blake's adaptation, I've been thinking so much about that wonderful line, every exit is an entrance somewhere else. Um, and so if you, if you read the novel and then see the play, uh, you have this sort of multi-layered experience, uh, something you don't get just from the novel alone, and something that you can add to the play. So I, I guess I, I'm, I'm all for participatory <laughs> play watching. Um, and, and I think it, it, if you keep no, don't think of the play as a substitute for the novels, or as uh, something that's to replace it, but, but something that simply broadens your vision of it, and then you can bring your own imagination and information in, into play. Um, so it's there. When, when Dennis says, we may rent it out, Rosemary's whole story is implied. I, I do think of the play as a reimagining of the novel. Uh, obviously, we're not trying to turn it into something it's not. We're trying to honor the source material and, and for people who know the novel well to, to tell the fundamental story. And yet at the same time, you're experiencing it in a different way. When you read a novel, it's a private experience. It's just you and Alice's story and whatever that conjures in your imagination. When you come to see it reinterpreted and performed live with a group this large or even larger over at Roundhouse Theater Bethesda, it, it becomes a communal experience. It's a shared act of imagination as opposed to a solitary act. That necessitates choices along the way. So what you're not seeing is a transposition of the story. You're in fact seeing an actor's interpretation of my interpretation of what Alice wrote. <laughs> There's several different layers involved. Gentleman in the back, yes. Um, I, I think my question might have been answered already, but I want to make sure. In the book, <coughs> very often, even within a, in one paragraph, the narrator calls, uh, refers to her father, and then a sentence later, or maybe even almost within the same sentence, refers to Dennis. And it goes back and forth. And I was always wondering why, why this change. Is the answer to that when she's referring specifically to a personal experience as opposed to when she's telling the story itself? Uh, yeah, I think you've got it. Um, that, that's, that's very much uh, what's going on. I mean, in the, and this, this makes the play, for me, even more interesting, because the novel is very much a novel about storytelling. Uh, and, and there are many scenes in the novel that the narrator has not witnessed, clearly. She wasn't even born for many of them. Um, so in some ways, she is the, this whole uh, apply your own imagination to the stories that you hear notion uh, is really embedded in the novel itself. So much of what she relays 
it's information she has gathered. She's not making things up whole cloth, uh, but she is retelling what she has been told uh, as almost an omniscient narrator would. So as Dennis, opposed to her personal experience. Exactly, right. So, so when she's dealing with her father uh, in her own life, he's her father, but then he becomes a character in the ongoing story <laughs> of Billy's life because that's really what is going on this afternoon in this Bronx bar. Uh, Billy's life is being retold uh, to maybe make it something other than it was. Yes, back here. To what degree did you, as the director or creative interpreter of the novel, use the actors to flesh out the skeleton that you talked about? The question is, to what degree did I rely upon the actors to flesh out the skeleton of the script? A great deal. Did they work with you in the early stages of fleshing out? Some of them did. We, we did two, was it two readings along the way? of the script in progress. The, the script took about two years from our initial meeting to the production that's going on a few blocks away from here. Probably a dozen drafts of the script. And occasionally along the way, we would gather actors in a room and just sit there and read the script. And Alice would come, and then we would have coffee the next day and, and, and chat. And I was offered many wonderful hints about how to unlock the story uh, and, and, and make it vivid for everybody in a live setting. That said, theater is a collaborative art form. And I can go in with all the ideas in the world about how I think that role should be played. But that's just a starting point. If you have good actors, they come in with their own ideas. And your idea just may not work for them. It may not sit well with them. You're always going to end up with a hybrid in the end. Uh, and I like to create a rehearsal atmosphere in which everybody feels like they can be a contributor to the final product. My, my standing rule is, best idea in the room wins. Doesn't have to be mine, doesn't have to be Alice's. It might be that guy who's playing Billy. Uh, or it might be another character's idea about a moment for Billy. If you, if you have a really good rehearsal room, people feel that they can suggest ideas to other actors and it's not threatening or judgmental. Uh, that's, a, that's a rare thing. Most, most actors tend to uh, be rather protective about what it is that they're creating. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, right here. Yes, uh, a question just like you know, uh, I'm not quite clear about the character of Billy. You know he's a alcoholic, he's a poet, but I don't know whether he's serious or should take him seriously or is he a, a fool question is how, what do we make of Billy, if I can sum it up. <laughs> um, well, I suppose uh, you're invited to make of him what you will. Uh, he's gone. Uh, his story. <laughs> one, one thing I learned very early on in composing the novel was that I had to put Billy in his grave to shut him up. <laughs> if all his friends were getting together at a Bronx bar, you can be sure he would be there. Uh, and, and he would have manipulated the stories about himself uh, to his own advantage. Uh, so the fact that he is uh, the dearly departed from the first sentence, I think sort of gives all his friends and relatives and the reader as well opportunity to make your own conclusion. I have an image of him through the community. Um, I mean, he started for me, the challenge for me was uh, I'm going to write a novel based on a stereotype. Uh, I'm going to do what uh, Fiction 101 classes always tell you not to do. Uh, don't write characters who are stereotypes. Uh, I'm a contrarian, so I thought, to hell with that, I'm going to write a novel based on a character who's a stereotype. Um, and the, the, the next step generally is then, well, what the, what the writer should do is uh, prove that the stereotype is, is only a facade. Um, that he seemed to be this lovable guy, but he was really a misanthrope. Uh, he was a child molester. He was something awful. Um, the contrarian in me said, no, I'm not going to take that route. Um, I'm going to write a story about a character who is everything he seems to be, and more. Um, so for me, Billy is that collective experience of him. Um, is he foolish? Absolutely. Is he sincere? Absolutely. 
Uh, is he self-destructive? Absolutely. Uh, can, are those things contradictory? Yes. Um, but that's who he is. You know, we had to deal with that in rehearsal as well. The actor, David Whalen, who plays the role of Billy, has been doing such a fantastic job. I and mean, those of you who have seen the production know, he's finding all those facets of the character. But one thing actors do is they try to, they try to wrap it up into a package. They have to feel like, okay, I know this guy. I've got him now. And he's a hard guy to get, as this gentleman was pointing out. And in the end, we just had to say, take each scene for what it is. There's a scene where he's being charming. There's a scene where he's rambling as a drunkard. There's a scene where he, where he strangles his wife. Those are all parts of him. Don't try to reconcile it. Just play each one for what it is and trust that over the course of the play or over the course of the character's lifetime, it will all resonate and it will seem well as complex as real human beings are. Yes, ma'am. As somebody who uh, grew up in New York and crossed London Boulevard on the long way to school, <laughs> I was wondering how much New York figured in the, in the way the story developed. Did everybody get that? How, mu how much New York figured in the, in the actual writing of the novel? Because, of course, it's filled uh, with descriptions uh, not, not only of the Bronx Bar, but of the Queens neighborhood where everybody lives in Long Island and everything else. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, New York figures, but of course it's my New York. It's not the real geographical place. It's a, it's a fictional place that, that I call New York. Uh, I discovered uh, with this novel, and not that I didn't have some inkling of it before, but it became very handy in the telling of this story, uh, the metaphorical benefit of New York and its environs. Um, here you have the geographical fact of a city which was the place where the immigrants came to. Um, and then you have another generation, the World War II generation that Billy belongs to, moving out into the suburbs. And then you have this Gatsby-esque uh, fresh green breast of the new world, which is the Hamptons. And metaphorically, it's the American dream. You know, um, uh, There's no great insight of mine in that. Uh, but since I was writing about these three generations, and since this is in many ways an immigrant story and an American dream kind of story, um, it, it was very handy for me to have the metaphorical geography of New York and its environs. And what is it all about? It's about yearning. The, the immigrants coming to New York City is about yearning, a better place, a better life, something for our children. What are the suburbs about? You know, for all the um, all all the, the ways they're denigrated in popular culture. At heart, the suburbs are about yearning. It's about wanting something better for the next generation. It's let's get out of the dirty city and find some green lawns. Uh, let's have some trees. It'll be beautiful out there. And then there's the the wealth, um, and as Billy says, the uh, almost uh, it almost feels as if you're on another planet. Uh, 